Climate change is one of the most talked about problems in both our nation and the world. Yet unlike many other pressing policy issues, we have not yet seen the full extent of the effects of human activities on the environment, which is why little action has been taken to combat climate change. However, the economic implications of this issue are enormous, so it is crucial that climate change is both understood and addressed. The greenhouse effect occurs naturally when sunlight reaches the earth, some energy is reflected back into space, some is absorbed and re-radiated as heat, but most of the heat is absorbed by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and reflected in all directions, thus further warming the earth. Gases that contribute to this effect include water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. Most of the gas in the atmosphere naturally is nitrogen and oxygen, which are made of two atoms and are bound tightly together and thus cannot vibrate or absorb heat. Greenhouse gases are made of three or more atoms that are held together loosely enough that they begin vibrating when they absorb heat and eventually release the radiation and it is absorbed by another molecule, keeping the heat near Earth. All occur naturally, but human activity has increased the release of several of these gases, expanding the greenhouse effect. Climate change has occurred throughout Earth's history and is generally attributed to small variations in Earth's orbit that affects this level of solar energy that Earth receives. The unprecedented warming trend in the past century is significant and likely to be the result of human actions. This could not solely be the result of changes in the sun's output. As seen in the graph to the right, since 1978, satellite images have shown a slight drop in solar irradiance, which is the energy given off by the sun, while temperatures have continued to increase astronomically. There is significant evidence supporting climate change. As seen in the graph to the right, over the past 800,000 years, carbon dioxide levels have varied but remained under 300 parts per million. Over the past 70 years, they have risen over 100 to 400 parts per million. Beyond that, we have observed global temperature rise, glacial retreat, rising sea levels, extreme events, and more, all caused by climate change. There are many likely impacts of climate change. The first is growing season changes, which is going to affect plant growth and yield and livestock production conditions and could cost the United States five to $16 billion per year. Second, there are going to be increases in droughts and heat waves. Heat waves and droughts will become more intense and by the end of the century, once in 20 year extreme heat days will occur every two to three years. The effect on water supply could cost 200 to 950 billion dollars over the next 100 years, especially in the Western United States. Third, there will be an increased intensity, frequency, and duration of North Atlantic hurricanes. Since the 1980s, we've already seen an increase in Category 4 and 5 hurricanes, just like we did with Hurricane Dorian this fall. The cost could be 10 to 400 billion dollars per year in damages over the next 100 years. Another likely impact has to do with precipitation patterns, melting Arctic ice, and sea level rise. There's going to be an increased prevalence of heavy precipitation events, and beyond that, melting Arctic ice has already begun to occur. Antarctica lost 127 billion tons of ice per year between 1993 and 2016. By mid-century, it is expected that the Arctic will be ice-free every summer. This leads to sea level rise, and there's an expected rise of 1 to 4 feet by 2100. This will then increase storm surges and high tides, leading to increased flooding. The cost of preventing flooding in cities like Miami, Charleston, and many others in the south and around us is $42 billion to $400 billion by 2040. The temperature changes occurring worldwide may not seem significant, as Earth's temperature has only increased 2 degrees Fahrenheit during the 20th century. This may seem small, but during the last ice age, the northeast was covered with 3,000 feet of snow, and the temperature averages were only 5 to 9 degrees lower than they are today. Clearly, small changes in temperature can lead to huge changes in the environment. So what are the market failures that are leading to climate change? A market failure occurs when allocation of a good or service is not efficient, leading to loss of welfare. There are several evident in climate change. The first is excessive burning of fossil fuels, leading to carbon dioxide being released. Second is agricultural and natural gas distribution, which is re releasing methane. And thirdly, nitrous oxide is being released through fertilizer use and fossil fuel burning. However, the largest problem is clearly carbon dioxide. Climate change is the world's largest market failure, as it affects environment, food supply, and more. The negative externality present is the oversupply of greenhouse gases, but it's incredibly difficult to estimate the social cost of carbon. We need government intervention to reach an efficient outcome, and there is an overall agreement among economists that a market failure exists and should be corrected. But how do we determine this efficient outcome? The table to the right that we discussed in lecture shows how variances in discount rate affect the social costs of carbon dioxide. When attempting to reach an efficient outcome, we must account for growth rates, technological changes, climate sensitivity, and many other factors. The social cost of carbon has been determined to be the net present value of damages caused by one ton of emitted carbon dioxide. This is hard to estimate, but is a useful standard for decision making. Quantity and timing of reductions to reach an efficient outcome depend on expected damages and the discount rate used. There are several policy solutions available to maximize welfare. The first is command and control regulations. These are uniform standards set to limit emissions of a pollutant or a mandated use of specific pollution control technology. However, this is not always the most efficient solution, though. There are emission taxes, which are a charge per unit of pollutant collected by the government. This yields a cost-effective allocation because firms will reduce emissions until the marginal cost of control is equal to the emission charge. 
These are difficult to determine how high the charge should be set, which makes this not always the most efficient solution either. Another solution is subsidies, which rewards polluters for lowering their emissions, and this could be a tax incentive grant or loan. There are also cap and trade or tradable permits, where a government sets a cap on pollution and firms are given or auctioned permits. The firms can then buy, sell, or trade their permits as needed, and the price of the permit will be the price at which the marginal control costs are equal across firms. This is the most effective method of regulation. There are also global agreements like the Paris Agreement, but as we've seen, political changes can affect the outcome of these policies. So how costly will climate change truly be? On previous slides, I discussed the individual costs of climate change consequences. Altogether, it's estimated that climate change could cost our country $2 trillion by 2100. There will be significant worldwide effects, including 26 million people per year forced into poverty, and by 2050, 143 million climate migrants from developing nations seeking refuge in developed nations like the United States. While the environmental and social impacts of climate change are incredibly important, we must consider the economic cost to our nation and world, both today and for generations to come.